and the United States. Uh, there was an attempt in Saudi Arabia to have uh, one of the Friday demonstrations, but the security presence was so strong that people were afraid to go on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, in Bahrain, as you know, there was it was pretty brutally crushed mm -hmm. uh, with Saudi led forces coming in. Uh, the U.S. supports all of this, so it keeps quiet. I mean, the main concern of the U.S. and its allies is the oil producing states. Mm -hmm. Bahrain is not a main oil producer, but it's part of the oil producing system. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't want any uh, trouble there. And in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, uh, the Emirates, uh, mm -hmm. everything's under control. So no Arab Spring. Uh, the, uh, can anything ever happen there? Well, you know, not, not, it's pretty hard to see. Remember, Saudi Arabia is a very rough place. It's the first of all, it's the most extreme Islamic fundamentalist state in the world. Uh, the U.S. and Britain have always supported that. They've traditionally supported and fostered radical Islam as a weapon against secular nationalism. And also these other guys with the oil. Mm -hmm. you know, so of course the West want to support them. And with that constellation of forces, it's not easy to see how an uprising could take place, but you know, you never know. That's uh, exactly what I was talking about, for example. I'm, I was talking mainly about uh, well-known uh, writers, uh, academics, professionals, uh, publishers, mm -hmm. who are constantly engaged in civil disobedience. And I think Turkey should be proud of having an intellectual class like that. Mm -hmm. But they go in and out of jail. In fact, I was the first time I went to Turkey, it was uh, essentially to participate in, as a co-defendant in a trial. In fact, insisted on being a co-defendant in a trial of a publisher. There was a lot of international publicity, so they done. The trials are total fraud, you know, they do what they want, so they put it off on some pretext and got them later. But uh, uh, if I hadn't been there, I'm sure he would have spent years in jail. And now there's a very repressive period. Actually, there's, there's a background. I mean, they say 10 years ago, which happened to be when I was there, mm -hmm. it was very repressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just coming out of a vicious period of uh, the counterinsurgency in southeastern Turkey, which killed tens of thousands of people, destroyed thousands of towns and villages, uh, they created uh, every kind of torture and horror that you can think of, millions of refugees, all supported by the U.S. It's, you know, the U.S. is pouring military aid uh, as the atrocities increased. But over the past ten years, this has been it's been eased. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been considerable progress, not anything like what it ought to be, but quite a lot. Uh, and uh, there's much for the country now. But mm -hmm. there is now a rising uh, regression of the kind of concern. I don't know anybody who's familiar at all with Syria who thinks that military intervention would make any sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are there are people who know the region in Syria, the main ones, Patrick Patrick Seal, one of the main historians of Syria, or Jonathan Steele, who's a British correspondent, uh, Charles Glass, an American correspondent. In fact, anyone who I know of who cares at all about Syria, not just kind of shouting self-glorification, mm -hmm. that thinks that military intervention will just make it worse, uh, that uh, negotiations are going to be hard, mm -hmm. but uh, it's the only way that can save Syria from a devastating internal conflict. Uh, it was pretty much the same in Libya. Mm -hmm. It's not that get reported here, but uh, the, the Britain, France, and the United States who were pretty isolated in the world. Uh, almost the entire world was calling for diplomacy and negotiations to fend off a, a likely humanitarian.
humanitarian catastrophe which mm -hmm. affected place and is still going on. Uh, but uh, you couldn't report it here. You know, just, just praise ourselves for our magnificence. Uh, but, uh, uh, and surely that's at least some part of uh, the reason why China and Russia don't want to sign on to a UN resolution. Mm -hmm. um, they were just tricked last time. The UN resolution didn't go for anything like what the three imperial powers immediately did. Uh, so they felt they got burned. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I think, military intervention. Uh, there's no good solution I can think of, mm -hmm. but uh, military intervention is probably the worst. Since then, it's far in the lead in vetoes, way beyond anyone else. And Britain is second, no one else is even close. So if you got rid of the veto, what you would be doing in effect is getting rid of the U.S. veto, the U.S. and British veto. Well, U.S. and Britain aren't going to accept that. Mm -hmm. So if you got rid of the veto, then do whatever they like. Just like the U.S. does anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, that's what power is. You have power and you have a kind of an obedient, quiet, intellectual class, not like Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, then you can do what you like. anything to do with the economy. Um, this kind of goes back to the 70s. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, so a kind of dramatic example then, uh, I was giving talks in Mexico mm -hmm. and I talked at the National University, which is it's a poor country, but it's a very good university, mm -hmm. high quality, a lively, active student body, and good, reasonably facilities, you know, no big football stadium. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I had to go from, after speaking there, I went to California. Mm -hmm. It's one of the richest places in the world. Uh, I got there just at the point when it was announced that uh, the funding of the state, uni uh, state university system, that less than half of it was coming from the state, majority from tuition. And this is part of an effort which is pretty clear to essentially privatize the great university to sort of Ivy League schools, you know, for the relatively privileged, mm -hmm. and uh, turn the rest of the system into uh, maybe vocational training to get people jobs in the California workforce, but not real education. This was the greatest public, public education system in the world. Well, Mexico is a poor country. Tuition is free. Uh, California is extremely rich. Uh, you got to soak people with tens of thousands of dollars uh, for tuition. I just I actually have, have three grandchildren in college now. And a couple days ago I got a letter from one of the colleges saying that the tuition is going up to, I think, $35,000 and then another $10,000 for room and board and stuff. You can't go to college unless you either have this wealth in the background or you're willing to end up with huge debt. Mm -hmm. Well, debts have a point. Uh, they are a technique of control. Uh, it uh, starts in the 70s when there was a lot of concern about 
what was called actually in the liberal circles, failure of the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Uh, young people aren't being indoctrinated properly by the schools, universities, churches. So you have to introduce more discipline. Well, this is a terrific disciplinary technique. That whatever your goals in life were, if you come out of the college with a huge debt over your head, there are things you just have to do in order to pay off that debt, whatever you wanted to do. Uh, so it's a technique of control. Actually, in Mexico, there was an attempt about about 10 years ago, uh, to add slight tuition, slow tuition, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a national student strike, and the government backed off, so tuition is still free, and it's free in other countries, like Germany is a rich country, tuition is free. In fact, in the United States itself, uh, the period of the greatest growth in the country in history, in fact, was the 50s and the 60s, it was not only very high economic growth, but it was also the period which laid the basis for the high-tech economy. That's where your computer was designed, and the internet, IT revolution, and so on. Uh, education wasn't totally free, but it was largely free. Mm -hmm. uh, the GI Bill, for example, uh, provided free education for a huge number of people who never would have been able to make it to college before. It was good for them, it was very good for the country. These are just not economic issues. Uh, they're uh, issues of control and uh, domination. Uh, the uh, systems are being turned into uh, advanced, uh, advanced colleges, you know, Berkeley-type colleges for the rich, and uh, nothing much for everyone else. It's part of the general move towards a sharply two-tiered society, uh, which goes on in all sorts of ways. Uh, and this is one of them, and it also poses this one. I mean, student debt now is uh, over a trillion dollars. That's huge.